We are now live on Facebook. A pleasant afternoon to all. Welcome to the first session of our Talakayan lecture series with the theme, A Shared Southeast Asian Story. This lecture session is jointly organized by the De La Salle University Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub and Mabalakat City College, Institute of Arts, Sciences, and Teacher Education and Pantalakayan Organization under the AB History Program. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Jonabel De Leon from Mabalakat City College under the Institute of Arts, Sciences, and Teacher Education. Today, I will be moderating this live lecture. To ensure our productive virtual engagement, please be mindful of the following netiquettes. Mute your microphone during the session. Second, listen attentively to the speaker. And lastly, if you have questions, use the chat box feature of the Zoom.
Again, welcome to the first session of our Talakayan Lecture Series. To give the opening remarks, let us all welcome the Director of Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub of De La Salle University, Dr. Fernando A. Santiago, Jr., to be followed by the Field of Study Head of AB History of Mabalacat City College, Sir John Edward E. Alfonso. Thank you, Ms. De Leon, for that introduction. Our convener, Mr. James Darwin Lagman, co-conveners, Dr. Melanie V. Barrios, sorry, Dr. Melanie V. Briones, Mr. Raymond Vergara, and Mr. John Edward Alfonso. Our speaker, Dr. Rommel Kuramig. Our guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is a pleasure for the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub, or SEARCH, to partner with the Mabalakat City College for this event. The Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub is a new research center in De La Salle University, Manila, and not everyone may be acquainted with who we are and what we do. So please allow me to take this opportunity to tell you about SEARCH. SEARCH was formally established in late 2019. Our mission vision is to become a cutting edge research center and networking hub that addresses regional concerns and serves as a social advocacy arm for De La Salle Philippines. Our role is to generate Southeast Asian research, collaborate with specialists, network with other centers and institutes of Southeast Asian studies, provide resource materials, and serve as a hub for all matters concerning Southeast Asia. Our goal is to be a research center of, for, and by Southeast Asians. Now, since our inception, we have strived to build a world-class research center, promote a Southeast Asian awareness, make the center better known locally and internationally, create a, net a network of Southeast Asian scholars and researchers, generate funds to support research and get research grants, produce quality research with focus on Southeast Asia and engage in social engagement activities. Now, as we have promoted the study of Southeast Asia, we have also partnered with other institutions and organizations in the Philippines and abroad, such as the Mabalakat City College, with whom we have the great pleasure to bring you this webinar today. Thank you, MCC, for partnering with us for this event. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our speaker, Dr. Rommel Kuraming of the University of Brunei Darussalam, for accepting our invitation despite his very busy schedule. I'm very much looking forward to hearing the lecture this afternoon. And I'm also looking forward to learning a lot from you. So once again, thank you everyone and have a pleasant day. Thank you for the warm welcome, Dr. Fernando A. Santiago. Let me call on now, Sir John Edward E. Alfonso, the field study Head of AB History of Mabalakat City College. Thank you, Ma'am Jonabel. To our distinguished guests, uh, Dr. Romel Kuraming, Dr. Fernando Santiago, uh, Professor Raymond John Vergara, Sir James Darwin Lagman, and to our uh, participants, a pleasant afternoon to everyone. So I'm sure that you would agree that what makes the Philippines a unique nation is our uh, is the complexity of our identity. We have to bring in some factors, our regional and ethno-linguistic identities, our Southeast Asian identity, and of course the influences that were uh, brought here by the Westerners. Uh, however, uh, in this complexity, we can also see uh, beauty and opportunities from our in our identity but we can make use we can appreciate this beauty and we can make use of these opportunities if we learn to embrace the complexities that we have so uh, we hope that through this lecture you will all get to appreciate uh, more our southeast asian heritage 
through the shared Southeast Asian story. I will not keep you for long. And with that, I, I hope that this will be a learning experience for everybody and uh, sit back and enjoy our lecture for today. Again, thank you, um, Sir John Alfonso for that welcome. At this juncture, I would now like to introduce I would now like to introduce our distinguished speaker. Dr. Rommel A. Kuraming is a senior assistant professor at the History and International Studies Program, University of Brunei, Darussalam. He completed a PhD in Southeast Asian Studies at the Australian National University. He also obtained a MA degrees from the National University of Singapore and the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Before joining UBD, he was a postdoctoral fellow at La Trobe University and National University of Singapore. His research focuses on various aspects and cases of knowledge, knowledge production and consumption in and on Southeast Asia particularly Indonesia and the Philippines. He published an international journal. He published international journals such as Critical Asian Studies, Southeast Asia Research, Time and Society, Inter-Asia Cultural Studies, Philippine Studies, and among others. His book, Power and Knowledge in Southeast Asia, State and Scholars in Indonesia and the Philippines was published in 2020. He served as a member of the Technical Advisory Committee of the UNESCO Project on Shared Histories in Southeast Asia. He also conceptualized one of the units and authored a number of lesson plans in this project. Again, join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, Dr. Rommel A. Kurami. Thank you very much, Jonabel, for the introduction. And I also thank uh, Dr. Santiago of Search and of course the officials of the Babalakat City College for this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. This, um, this topic has been of uh, interest to me and I was fortunate to be given an opportunity to participate um, in the UNESCO's uh, Shared History of Southeast Asia project, starting sometime in uh, 2015. Um, so this is a multi-year project that um, seeks to produce um, a teaching package um, that can be adapted in different settings in Southeast Asia. The original idea is for high school, but um, I think the level of um, the level of the output is um, really more suitable to an introductory some introductory modules for the university. So I'll be talking more about that in a while. So this, um, the objective of the project is, yeah, to come up with the innovative teaching and learning materials on the shared histories of Southeast Asia from the sub-regional perspective. And the main idea for this is to encourage mutual understanding. So this, um, because there are, 11 countries in the region. And um, there are a lot of uh, similarities as well as differences 
that characterize these different countries. Um, the focus of this, the approach that we have adopted in this uh, project is to emphasize similarities, complementarities, mutual, mutual respects, while also acknowledging the differences. And um, the, the idea is to confront perceptions um, that reinforce antagonistic attitudes as well as negative stereotypes. So what is the context of this um, project? Earlier, there were similar projects done in Europe as well as in Northeast Asia. So we knew that we know very well that the European Union consists of various countries that uh, due to historical legacies have um, persistent, uh, this, this proved to be a persistent source of irritations among different countries. So they thought, they thought of um, um, coming up with that kind of shared history project. And the same approach has been applied in the case of Northeast Asian countries, specifically um, between China, Korea, and Japan. So we know very well that these three countries, the, the historical legacies of conflict is, is really um, enormous. And um, they tried hard as well to do this kind of thing. Now I've heard, I'm not sure to what extent um, the, the European case has been quite uh, successful. The Northeast Asian case has also been, um, yeah, I, I, I know the difficulties involved in dealing with the histories of China, Korea, and um, Japan, but at least a certain degree, they managed to come up with um, also concrete outputs. Now, given this kind of things, and then sometime in 2008, 2009, a lot of things happening in the region that highlighted the, the problems coming from the historical baggages that um, countries in the region like Malaysia and Indonesia um, has, has been carrying. So there has been this kind of so-called heritage war between Indonesia and Malaysia. And to a certain degree, Singapore was also um, involved. This um, flared up, for example, specifically in 2009, when um, Discovery Channel had this uh, <clears throat> show, had this um, um, to, to promote tourism in, in, uh, in Malaysia. And let me show you this um, very brief video clip. Wait, 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 wait. Let me. Sorry for that. I should have. Okay, um, I think I'm having some kind of uh, technical issue, but the idea behind this uh, <clears throat> advertisement is to, the, 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 it's supposed to be for the promotion of Malaysia, Malaysian tourism, and they made use of uh, the pendant dance. A dance that is very famous, very common in Bali, and um, so it was shown that uh, they're using that. And apparently the idea is Malaysia is stealing or claiming ownership of that kind of dance as part of its heritage. And a lot of Indonesians really didn't take it well. So there was that set off a lot of uh, um, commotion, controversies, hatred to the point that um, there were demonstrators in Jakarta that uh, they, they demonstrated 
in the not just demonstrated peacefully, but um, they they um, throw uh, they threw faces to uh, embassy in in in, in uh, Malaysian embassy in Jakarta. So it it the, the level of tension reached that um, that high, and that, that demonstrates the potential. Um, yeah, that kind of conflict, that historical, uh, uh, his, his historical and heritage questions can can give rise to. So this happens against um, the backdrop of the fact that there are other aspects like batik that uh, that, that uh, has the same similar kind of uh, problem. Both Malaysia and in in, in in Indonesia were claiming it. Rasa Sayang, for example, that kind of song, folk song, that even earlier, a few years um, before 2007, that already had that kind of um, controversial um, event where, whereby also Malaysia seemed to be claiming this kind of song as theirs, whereas the Indonesians say that that's ours. That's, a, that's, that's, a, that's our song. So even in food, that um, that happened. Who 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 was the who owns really chicken rice, chili crab, laksa, bakute, rendang? All of this kind of food. Um, the questions arises in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. Who actually was the origin of this kind of um, food? So it's not only in Malaysia and Indonesia. Indonesia that this happened also between Thailand and Cambodia, of course, where um, a lot of us are quite familiar with Previhir and the temple, and then the 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 um, perhaps also the the part of the dance, the hand gesture that is quite common in um, Thai and Cambodian dances. So they they fought for it. Who who really was the or original? supposedly owner or the origin of this kind of gesture. So uh, that happened as an offshoot of the fact that um, Cambodia's petition to include this, this um, hand gesture as part of the intangible heritage of Cambodia. And that was awarded by, agreed to by, by uh, UNESCO in 2008. So we're also familiar with the dispute over Sabah between Philippines and Malaysia. So all of, this, all of these instances generated a kind of tensions that highlighted the fact that history, particularly ownership of heritage, can really bring, uh, can really give rise to a lot of conflict. <clears throat> Actually, um, if we ask the question, who owns Tinikling? We all know Filipinos where we, we take pride in uh, claiming that Tinikling is our national dance. It's a Filipino kind of dance. But if you watch, for example, this video. <laughs> I, I, so, sorry, this cannot be. If, if, if this video would be blown up, you can see what's happening here. You would see these people um, dancing and having this kind of tinikling. But you'd, be, you'd, you'd probably be surprised that this is not in the Philippines, but it is in uh, Sabah, in Kadasans in Sabah. Same as another instance. When you see this, if, if, if this, if we can only see in full blown this, um, uh, this, um, they're also doing the thing. Thank <laughs> you. 
wait. Oops. Sorry for that. I apologize for that. I couldn't uh, bring it to stop. Okay, so that to be clean is also, it's, it's being done, uh, you'd be surprised by a group of people called Karens. The Karens are, um, the Karens are among uh, one of the hill tribes people in, in the highlands in Myanmar. So it's good that so far Tinikling has not figured among some kind of heritage war between Philippines and other countries, but uh, perhaps later on, when something is shown internationally and Filipinos would see it, the Karenis and the Kadasan Duson, for example, were claiming that it is their heritage, perhaps Filipinos would rise in some kind of revolt and say, no, that's ours, that's our national dance. But in reality, this kind of thing is being shared. Okay, uh, so given this kind of context of conflict, so the... Okay, given this kind of conflict, um, uh, given this kind of conflict, um, this this uh, professor from Thailand he said that um, bad history, bad education, bad neighbor relations. So this very aptly put the relationship between the kind of history that we're taught and the kind of education that is imbibed by um, young generations and which could possibly lead to bad neighborly relations. Um, so why could history be a problem? In many countries in the world, particularly in Southeast Asia, history, is written from a fiercely nationalist standpoint. So we we have long been we have long believed that um, um, nationalist writing in history is a good one. Okay, so because of our colonial experience, it's so easy to accept that kind of proposition that history should be nationalist. But we have to remember as well that nationalist history is double-edged. It could unify and strengthen the nation but it could also be used by certain groups to advance their self selfish interests. And in the process, um, it could also generate conflict. So rather than taking a look at history from the national, nationalist standpoint, how about we try doing it from the regional or sub-regional uh, perspective? And um, this fits very well in the context of Southeast Asia. Because we know very well that um, the much of Southeast Asia is shared. A lot of uh, culture, languages, uh, traditions, all these things were shared by people from across the borders. People, for example, in Mindanao and those in Sabah, they're very closely related. People from in, on, the, on the Malay Peninsula side and the Sumatran side, they're very closely related. A lot of them are... are, are Hints. So given this kind of, um, but despite this kind of commonalities, <clears throat> our historical experience had divided us into different national boundaries, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines. And we easily forget that this kind of division is very recent in history. Okay, it's not, it's not the, um, not, it's not the cultural bedrock of, um, our culture in this particular part of the world. Much of what is in Southeast Asia is shared. And that's precisely the, the, the idea behind taking a look at history from the shared history standpoint. So um, when we conceptualize this project, um, there are a number of guiding principles in content development. So 
as much as possible, use primary sources as well as multiple type of sources. It's not just the written ones, but also um, video. We use uh, video, YouTube, uh, all these kind of very different kind of sources. Um, so long as they will allow students to understand the material, yeah, we took the note of that from the multiple perspective, regional and multinational in scope. And the balance um, ground up and top down um, perspectives. So it's not just uh, the, it's not just a top down approach from the elite down. It's not just from the ground up. Okay, it's not just from the history from below, but we try to negotiate between combining these two. So we're looking for topics that are engaging in the, um, that kind of that can easily resonate to the experience of, uh, of high school students. And we also endeavor to employ progressive pedagogies, student-centered, transformative rather than transmissive kind of learning. And uh, also important is that this should be grounded in local conditions. So the school and the community relation must be well emphasized. Okay, so after about five years, four or five years of uh, hard work, uh, finally, 2019, UNESCO has published um, this five volume uh, output of this project. So there is a teacher's guide. There, is, there are four units. Each of the units were also published separately. Um, and this can be accessed through this link. So I, I, I'd like to, I'm going to give you a rundown of this. Um, I'm going to give you a rundown of uh, what is inside this and um, in the next couple of slides, but I'd really like you to take a look because um, this is, a, I think it's, a, uh, I'm, I'm surprised as well um, uh, by the achievement of, uh, it's only in, it's only last couple of months when I get to see this the output, and um, I'm I'm happy with the output and uh, it's innovative in many ways and you might find it as well. Okay, it's a very different approach to Southeast Asian history, so it will be a very interesting um, project to explore. Okay, so the four units. Unit one is about people and places, about environment, human, uh, human environment relations. The second is early centers of power, so more political. Third is rice and spice. So the first is more geographical, second is more political, third is uh, more cultural, particularly about food, so rice and spice. And uh, fourth, the fourth uh, theme has to do with um, originally our title here is Southeast Asia in the world, because the focus here is in the interaction within the region and the region in the rest of the world. Okay, and but uh, when, upon the publication, I saw that they changed the title to Envisioning Southeast Asia, which is also um, quite appropriate. So it is in the Unit number four that I had uh, have played quite a lot of role. So I'm one of those who conceptualized this unit and um, identified some of the key, each key areas to focus on. And eventually also got involved in writing uh, two lesson plans in this uh, unit. So I'm going to focus on unit four. And I'd like to give you an example of how, how we do it. So you'll be, you have an idea. So this unit has seven lesson plans. First is the, about the ASEAN. Second focuses on the Southeast Asian games, the sea games. So the role of history, the role of sports in community building in the region. I wrote that uh, lesson plan. <clears throat> number three, I also wrote the number three, this, this lesson plan. 
from fragmented to shared histories. Soccer, basketball, and sepak takraw in Southeast Asia. This one, I'm going to give you a little bit more detail um, in the next couple of slides. I'm going to use this as an example of how, did, how, how we did it. So um, number four is cultural heritage of Southeast Asia. Five, contemporary art. Six, popular music in Southeast Asia between global and, lo uh, global and local culture, and seven, Southeast Asia film in empire. I particularly like these two, last two, six and seven. This, uh, um, it's difficult for high school and it's also quite difficult for the university students. But the idea behind these two, last two, is very um, groundbreaking, I should say. It's, I, I, the, the, the one who wrote this is, is a friend of mine and, and uh, he, he really put a lot of heart into it and came up with a very fascinating insights on, um, on how the shared uh, histories of various countries in the region, as well as their interaction with the rest of the world through film, Hollywood, for example, um, helps in creating regional identity. Okay, so yeah, I am. Um, so I'm going to give you this kind of example. I'm going to use this fragmented to, from fragmented to shared histories, sepak takraw. Okay, so this particular lesson plan, which can be taught for two, two, three sessions in a one-hour class, for example. So we we I endeavor to um, come up with an. Uh, I endeavor to illustrate how how history can be how history can be understood through sports, and um, because you see in the in Southeast Asia, we, Philippines stands as a unique as a unique country for being the only country in the region where basketball is the most popular sport. The rest of the region. The rest of the region, it's soccer. So it's Philippines is an odd man out in the region so far as sports is concerned. Actually, it's, on, it's not just in terms of sports. There are many other things by which Philippines is, uh, it, set, it sets itself apart from the rest of the region, but basketball is one of them. So this kind of uh, legacy, this, this is um, rooted in, the, in our colonial legacy. The fact that basketball is the most dominant sport in the Philippines is a product of the fact that we were colonized by the Americans. And um, soccer for the rest of Southeast Asia, is, it's a reflection of the fact that they were colonized by different European powers where soccer was really um, an important sport. So, Sepak takraw, on the other hand, is, an, is a sport that is indigenous to the region. This kind of, um, I was supposed to show you a, a very brief video on Sepak takraw, but apparently the embedding did not work. So Sepak takraw, um, if, if you're familiar with the sport, this is a very fascinating sport. A lot of foreigners who had seen how it is being played, we're amazed at the level of uh, acrobatic skills that, um, that, are, that are necessary in order for you to play it well. And that put, they say it puts to shame volleyball and soccer in terms of uh, the agility and the physical prowess and that, that, that is needed in order for the sports to be played well. I, yeah, I, I would have liked um, to show this kind of video so you would see how amazing Sepak Tokro is being played. Um, but uh, but uh, yeah, due to technical problem, uh, my apologies for that. Okay, now this, this kind of uh, game is known, it's called by different names in different parts of uh, the region. So Sepak Tokro is basically quite common in Indonesia. Sepak Raga is more for Malaysia. 
Sipa, for example, is common in the Philippines. Um, in in Thailand, is takro. It in in uh, so in Cambodia they have their, their own. In Vietnam, they have their own name, but the principle is fundamentally similar. And um, it is growing in popularity. It's not yet. Um, it's not yet played in the Olympics. I'm not sure if Asian Games, perhaps Asian Games, not yet still. I'm not sure. But in Southeast Asian Games, it's being played. But this kind of sports increasingly becoming popular in different parts of the world, in, in North America, in Europe. So there's uh, 25 countries where you can find, for example, um, associations of Sepak Takro, which uh, points to the fact that this is increasingly becoming a, a popular sport. So I use in this particular lesson plan um, how, how our fragmented history that has been brought about by colonial legacies, how it evolved, okay, how it evolved into something that is more towards uh, creating that kind of uh, regional identity. And I use basketball, soccer, and sepak takraw, and the development of sepak takraw in particular from being uh, an indigenous game being played anywhere to the one that is being played as a competitive sport in uh, sea games, in other um, international competition. And with increasing popularity of sepak takraw, and this is associated with the notion of Southeast Asia, so it, 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 it it um, plays a part in creating that kind of regional identity for many Europeans, for example, for Europeans and for um, uh, Americans and other foreigners who play this game or are enthusiasts of this game, they know for a fact that this is a kind of sport that came from Southeast Asia. So you see the process by which this kind of um, identification helps in the formation of regional identity. So that's a very big, that is a fundamental idea in, um, in this lesson plan. And I would like you to take a look at it and uh, you see how it goes. And uh, it's up to you uh, actually to, um, yeah, because it's, um, it can be it can be adjusted to suit the kind of uh, uh, level that your students are in. But one thing that um, one thing that uh, I had in mind when I thought of uh, why why would I use sepak takraw as a kind of case? Uh, why, for example, why sports? For example, I was thinking the best way by which we can engage students is to talk about something that easily resonates with them. And what more could be more resonant to high school students than sports? Okay, in this particular, um, other than sports, popular culture, music, film. So in this particular unit, we tried hard to focus on uh, uh, different aspects of popular culture. Things that uh, a lot of people, not just uh, the highly educated, can, can relate. So by using this as a, a platform, we hope to get as much um, attention from the students who are normally, they're easily bored with anything historical. So we know for a fact, it's a challenge to get students interested in history. And uh, the reason why this uh, unit focuses on things like that is precisely to get them easily, more easily enticed. Their attention will be, yeah. Uh... Okay, so just um, concluding remarks. So yeah, I emphasize that, I'd like to emphasize that history is a double-edged um, uh, sword, can unify and bring peace, but it can also divide and cause conflict. So it's, it's up to us how we will be more, um, conscious of the way how we're going to use history. Okay, so this, this kind of effort to prevent history from being a tool for conflict formation is 
one way to do it is to go beyond the nationalist lens. And we try to take a look at it from the prism of the shared histories. Um, and um, finally, I'd like to make uh, everyone familiar um, with this uh, it, with this study, with this publication. It's um, accessible via this link. And um, and the and you, I, I'm I'm sure you will benefit a lot from this uh, publication. Share it's it's free. You, you don't have to pay anything. It's for everyone's consumption. It's just a matter of uh, adjusting the idea and the materials um, to your um, to your uh, that that suits the, the kind of school, the level that you are in. And um, yeah, so you'd find in this um, book or series of books a lot of uh, a lot of sources, a lot of sources, a lot of um, um, materials, uh, instructional materials that will be helpful in carrying out the lessons. Actually, this um, um, in because in all countries. Uh, in all countries in the region that participated in, in, in this particular project, the, there were schools that were designated as uh, pilot schools. In the, in the Philippines, two or three schools in Butuan City were used to pilot test um, these this, uh, lesson plans. And uh, the idea is for them to come up with a modified version of lesson plans that will suit their own conditions. So, uh, so long as the spirit of the shared history is there, it's up to them to use their own resources. Uh, it's up to use. Uh, it's up to them to use. Um, yeah, to adjust the level. And um, I, I haven't uh, seen the output of that. I have seen the output in Brunei, because I'm, I was the one who, who supervised uh, a number of uh, schools that did this kind of pilot testing here in Brunei. And I'm impressed the way how they, they managed to um, adapt or adjust the lesson plans here um, to, to be useful for their own purpose. Because generally, I think this is more for university level. We were targeting high school, but um, oh, practically everyone in the group that made this uh, project are university professors. We are all from different um, universities and our understanding of history and uh, ped pedagogy. Um, yeah, it's, it's rather challenging um, for us to really go to that level, but we tried what we could, but um, I, I, the output I think is uh, more suitable to the university. Okay, so that's all for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rommel A. Kurami. I hope you all enjoy this afternoon's session. Indeed, we learned a lot from this uh, afternoon's lecture. Before we go to the next part of the program, the open forum, let us all watch a video presentation from the Mabalakat City College Performing Arts. While you are watching the video, you can type in your questions in the Q&A option. Thank you.
All right, so at this point, we shall now have the open forum. Okay, so let me read some of the questions first. Okay. Let's have the first question. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Rommel Kurami. Is this parallelism as claimed by Joseph Fichter? I hope I pronounced that correctly. Thank you. That is from Sir Arnel Perez. Hello, hello. I have some. Okay. Problems. Again, Dr. Kurami, we are now on our um, open forum part. So, uh, okay. are you ready for Are you ready for the questions? Okay. <laughs> Can I clarify what 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 does uh, he mean by the question? Parallelism. Uh, of, what is exactly? Uh, what it says here is this parallelism as claimed by Joseph Fichter from Sir Arnel Perez. Yeah, okay. Um, Can I? okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll wait for Sir uh, Arnel Perez to clarify the kind okay. of parallelism. Yeah. Let's go to the second question first, sir. So we have, um, okay. Will it make sense in having a new one's Asian identity if shared history is included in the depth ed curriculum in Araling Panlipunan? That is coming from Sir George. Okay, so I know this guy. He was my former student in De La Salle University. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it, considering how complex, considering how complex um, Asia is, the identities that will always be associated with Asia is uh, all, also going to be complex. And the new ones, um, it, it will require a lot of effort to be nuanced in, in um, forging that kind of identity. But the, the countervailing force is that identity is not usually um, a political tool. And a political tool will always Political interest will always um, it will always shape the the identity. Okay, so however a political interest, um, yeah, in the way how it uses particular identity, it will smoothen 
those kind of nuances so long as um, it fits the political interest. Now, if we include um, the in the curriculum, it's it's um it's it's up to us how how we really design and the extent. To, we, it's up to us how we ca calibrate. We calibrate uh, the the scale of identity that we wish to 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 do or to achieve in emphasizing through in emphasizing or through the use of a shared history approach. Okay, so even the the, the the very idea of shared history presupposes some kind of scale. Shared by whom? Perhaps these things that we consider as shared, not really shared by by others. Okay, so we 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 emphasize, for example, the the shared the kinship between uh, between the people, for example, in Mindanao and those in Sabah. But uh, we we can always expect that uh, that kind of uh, the notion of being shared is uh, from a particular standpoint, and from certain standpoint, that idea of being shared is not there. Okay. And again, a bottom line there is uh, political interest. What is the political interest that that will um, determine the scale of being of, of, of sharing? And that will, when you do, when you go down to the level of uh, textbooks or curriculum development, that will also um, be reflected. What kind of political interest will determine that that kind of uh, scale? Thank you. Okay, so there is another question. Yes, Dr. P uh, Rommel, there's another question. So let me read the question. Yes. This is from Sir Ariel Lopez. Hi, Prof Rommel, thanks for sharing this project. Wouldn't a regionalist perspective like its nationalist counterpart also generate narrow views, especially against neighboring regions like India and China, with whom Southeast Asia share long and deep historical ties? Oh, yeah, that's a very good question. Another very good question. And uh, I think what I said earlier, um, yeah, uh, addresses this, this kind of question. Uh, what is the political interest that will be served by, by shared history if nationalist history is also shaped by political interest the same way that shared history is also like that. So as, as Ariel uh, um, mentioned, Ariel Lopez, yeah, I also, yeah, I thank you very much, Ariel, for that question. Yeah, so that kind of, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, it was, is our interest that will uh, determine the kind of uh, sharing that we will acknowledge and promote. And there is a second part to that question. Yes, uh, Doc, here's the follow-up question. How did the project navigate the messy and politics and histories so as not to have a polished narrative in the interest of shared histories. Yeah, again, this is a very good point. Okay? Um, it's, uh, we have gone through a lot of discussion on, on, on this. And in, in the process, um, what, what, happened, what happened in the, what happened, uh, if I remember still right, is in effort to come up with a shared history approach there are certain things that um, will have to be uh, sacrificed okay so just like national history that there are things that will be de-emphasized or forgotten shared history will also be um, like that whatever it is that will prove beneficial for the effort that those are the things that will be included so in 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 um, I cannot think of a specific example at this point, but uh, uh, yeah. So anyway, I, if I if something pop up in my mind, I will I will share with you the specific example of the kind of discussion we had. 
certainly there are those kind of messy politics that we had to navigate in in the process of i th i think it's in other uh, units that these things um, have been more pronounced rather than in, in, particularly in the political more political uh, aspect of the units in our unit in the um, Southeast Asia in the world or envisioning Southeast Asia, the unit four, um, yeah, it's, it's, we managed to get along well with the, with the political because we're dealing with the aspects of politics that is uh, the, not the conventional politics, but more, more on uh, yeah, popular culture. We talk about music, popular culture, uh, sports that are um, often um, not seen as political. Ah, okay. I just, I just, uh, something pop up in my mind. Okay, one thing I, in the Southeast Asian, in the panel, I, I mean, in the lesson plan on Southeast Asian games. Okay, in the lesson plan on Southeast Asian games, I was also the one who wrote that. I shared that. Uh, um plan in 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 a in a forum and um one of the things that i was trying to um suggest in that lesson plan is that the c games c games it may be we no normally take it as just a sports it's not political okay but but the very idea of a competition where the, supposedly the best prepared athletes will be the one to get the gold, silver, and bronze medals. What is the hidden politics behind this kind of, uh, behind this kind of sports activity? Perhaps it's very difficult to detect that kind of what indeed is political in this kind of games like Olympics, Asian games, sea games. But one thing that um, we can, we can uh, sense is, is um, if we ask, for example, what gets, to be, what gets to be overshadowed by this kind of competition? What gets to be emphasized? What particular values gets to be emphasized when we have this kind of competition? So this idea that um, it takes only a lot, the proper effort and technique in order for you to excel. Okay, so the when we project that to the society, whereby in society in our society people are born poor. And so many are hampered by the structural inequalities. No matter how hard they try, even if they work 24 hours a day, many of these people will never really get out of the level of poverty or lower middle class standing that they, they, they are in because the structural limits are there to hamper their kind of views. But the sports activities like Southeast Asian Games and Olympics create an image in the, in the minds of many people that is just a matter of working hard. They okay? keep on working hard, learn the technique, push yourself really hard, and you will succeed. So you will see that kind of bourgeois um, value system that is being promoted by sports. And if, people, if this kind of values gets to be imbibed by a lot of people, by, by watching uh, soccer and basketball and sea games, for example. So that, that gets to be um, put in the minds of a lot of people. Yeah, indeed, it's just a matter of us um, do, doing, uh, doing all the hard work for us to succeed. So we easily forget the fact that structural inequalities are deeply ingrained in our society, particularly in the Philippines that even if you work 24 hours a day, you will never become uh, yeah, that kind of success that you would like to become. It's very pessimistic kind of view, but to a certain degree, you would say that's a reality. And in that particular, 
when, when I when I shared that kind of uh, lesson plan to that group, uh, somebody from from Thailand reacted violently because in her idea, sports is just sports. There is no politics involved in sports. But again, yeah, that's that's what it yeah how it went. Okay, um, thank you for that question. Let's move on to the next. Uh, yes, Dr. Kuraming, there's a one related again to Dr. Lopez's uh, question. So, however, uh, thank you for this project, Dr. Kuraming, very timely. However, just a related query with Dr. Lopez's. So how did you reconcile these historical conflicts among national narratives? Example, the Saba crisis, terrorism in Mindanao, and so on. Okay, so yeah. Um... Uh, the idea is uh, one of the things that I've noted in one of the slides is uh, the presentation of multiple perspectives. So rather than taking sides, the students, the lesson plans were designed in such a way that the perspectives on both sides were presented. I think there is no, nothing specific, re relate, specifically related to Saba claim that were included in the four units. But in other cases that are similar, yeah, that kind of historical conflict, um, the idea is not to resolve, but the idea is to present different perspective that different countries have their own different interests. And, um, and um, the, the, the goal that was trying to be reached is by looking at the things from, different perspectives, it's the shared understanding. If not the shared history, the common history will be um, reached. Okay. okay, thank you, sir. Uh, we still have one, uh, two, uh, two last questions. This is again from Sir Arnell, the question a while ago. So what is common with the Southeast Asian countries with regard to culture, what can you say about cultural parallelism? Oh, okay. Actually, there are quite a lot, okay? Um, before, yeah, being a Filipino and being confined to the Philippines for much of my life, I didn't notice that, okay? We Filipinos tend to ignore our neighbors. We tend to ignore our neighbors. Now, at some point starting 2000, when I, when I went out, the first time I studied overseas. So I studied in Singapore um, for masters. It is from that point on that I, I become uh, more involved, more exposed to the region. So I stayed, I lived in uh, Indonesia for a while. I traveled. Um, in different parts of the region, I eventually I settled in Brunei or up, up to now. So I've been 10 years, I've been here for almost 11 years. And um, it is only when I get out of the Philippines when I realize that there's indeed so much that uh, we share. Okay, there's indeed so much that we share. I realized before, I didn't believe, for example, the view uh, quite commonly, uh, quite clear in the writings of uh, Professor Susa Lazar, that, that idea that um, our, our modern features are, um, are just some kind of a thin layer that is put on the cultural structures that is shared by, by many, specifically in the region. It's, um, it's when I went out and I, I, I got exposed, for example, I was rather, it's a shock of recognition, for example, that uh, I realized that the Indonesians and Malaysians, they, they have all these kind of ghost stories, all this, even the idea of, uh, our, that is quite comparable to our idea of Tikbalang, Tianak. I, I was surprised that they also have those kind of things. And they, 
and they um the the ghost stories that they enjoyed or were afraid of were just similar to ours and and the you look at for example at the kind of uh, um the the kind of jokes that they they tell in the way how they tell it i i was surprised that kind of affinity because normally we filipinos when we are feeling rather embarrassed or un, unsure we just smile okay we just smile we just we just try to go through the difficult situation by smiling and i realized that they are the same thing okay that they they are this they have the same kind of um, mannerism by which they try to cope with certain behavior so for example i remember this case that uh, one of the bombers in bali the bali bombers early 2000 uh when when he he was brought to the court and he was pictured who was being brought out of the court and he was pictured by western press as smiling and in the caption in the in the western press they say see this is the bomber who killed uh, who killed so many people and yet all he could do is to smile so for for somebody like me i i i that, that i understand how how people uh, how in our part of the world try to cope with some kind of those kind of difficult situation i didn't find it re- i i couldn't interpret that as an expression of how how indeed how callous indeed this this guy was that kind of smile that kind of uh, that kind of uh, um facial expression i wouldn't readily take it as a, as an absence of remorse okay i would take it as something that is just yeah whenever we have the kind of difficult situation we we do that kind of thing and when it comes to language food there are enormous things that we we share okay our food is just uh, much too bland for indonesians and malaysians but there are things in our food that we shared with uh, with with the rest the use of bagoong the, the use of all, all this kind of uh, yeah we have their, they have their own belachan all this kind of feast uh uh patis all these kind of things that are just done in in a different way so food mannerism language the language for example um tagalog and i i, I it's unfortunate that i don't know other filipino languages aside from tagalog but i ash- I assume that if I know several Filipino languages, the the cognate, the percentage of cognatic relations between Filipino languages and in Malay would be significantly high. They uh, one study say that for Tagalog, about 30% of the la- of the words are, um, are 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 cognatic in relationship, and I can I can see that. Okay, there are several of our words. that uh, if they they're not exactly the same you would see the relationship like for example um when we say tangan hold by hand in 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 malay it's it's also tangan is hand okay so those kind of uh, dalam hati for example dalam hati in 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 malay yeah it's felt by heart Okay, so in our case, the lamhati is some kind of sorrow, but in Malay, it's also yeah in the heart or felt by the heart. So you will see that kind of relationship. And uh, because of this kind of, uh, there are many other things. If you remove the trappings, if you remove Islam and Christianity, okay, if you remove Islam and Christianity out of the equation, uh, there you would. it would be much easier to see the affinities between Filipinos, Malay, Indonesians and Brunei. Because of the difference in religion, that's very that's more challenging to do that. But if you take if you remove these two, I think that would become even clearer. Okay, so thank you. That's that's what I can say about that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kurami. We shall now have the last question. This is from Sir Santiago, of a student from MCC from Abalakat 
City College. Okay, so the question is, good afternoon, Dr. Kurami. In terms of methodologies or strategies in delivering the content of a lesson, what are the suggestions you could probably give on how a teacher of Brunei can deliver the content of the shared history of Southeast Asia? So in terms of methodologies and strategies. Oh, and specifically she was referring to teacher in Brunei. Yes, it's a, a teacher of Brunei. Okay, so that, that how do the teacher of Brunei deliver the content of the shared history? Hmm. Um, based on what I, I saw that they did um, in, in adapting, modifying the, the lesson plans that we made, they, um, they made use of uh, what is um, readily, um, readily recognizable uh, to their student. So rather than, for example, use the song that we suggested, they're going, they found a song that is quite similar, functionally similar, but uh, is even um, more um, recognizable by, by, by Bruneian students. So rather than um, using a particular um, video clip that is uh, we're talking about certain thing in the example is in the example being shown are from Indonesia or Malaysia, for example, or in Thailand. They look for for uh, video that it's Bruneian who are the ones they're involved. And they because some of the readings source as part of the sources in the package uh, could be really high level. Okay, higher level. Okay, so they came up with um, they they simplified it. They made summaries of this kind of readings in a much com much more compact way in a language that they that be they believe the students will be uh, able to understand. So this kind of adaptation, adaptive strategies, they did in coming up with an uh, um, um, adapted or a modified uh, lesson plans. Um, it's, it's, the general idea is um, they, they draw from, their, from the resources that they are um, much more access, that are more accessible to them, more understandable for them, and um, yeah, more relevant for the students because that way they will be able to get the students' um, attention more. Yeah, that's what I think I can say to that. Okay, thank you again, Dr. Rommel A. Kuraming for answering those questions and for the great presentation. It was a pleasure to have you with us. It's my when pleasure. Thank you very much, Jonabel, and others who have stayed with us until now. Okay, the 129 people that are online. Thank you very much. I wish... I said something that uh, that might be useful for you. Okay, so thank you, thank you. We now move on to the awarding of certificate of recognition. Allow me to read the citation of the certificate, Dr. Ramel A. Kurami. Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub Search of De La Salle University, Mabalakat City College, Institute of Arts, Sciences and Teacher Education, and Pangkat ng Talasaliksik sa Kasaysayan, Certificate of Recognition. This certificate is awarded to Dr. Ramel Kurami for sharing his invaluable expertise as the resource speaker during the Talakayan Lecture Series with the theme, A Shared Southeast Asian Story, held via online on September 3, 2021 given this third day of September, 2021. Signed by our Dean, Dr. Melanie V. Briones, co-convenor, uh, Sir, Sir Raymond John D. Vergara, MPR, for us, Dr. Fernando A. Santiago Jr., and Sir James Darwin N. Lagman.
Again, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Karami, for this um, afternoon's lecture session. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just a reminder for our participants, for you to receive your certificate of participation, please complete the evaluation link, the evaluation form shown on our screen. So only those who are in the Zoom meeting shall receive these certificates. So you may get first our evaluation link.